Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to MBA Missions uh, presentation through GMAT Club on creating standout business school essays. Um, because I can't see people on this forum, can somebody just type in the chat that you're here? Because otherwise I'm talking to an empty room. Nope. There you are. Let us know that you're here. Someone's here. Yay. Okay. All right. Let's get started. While people come in the room, I'm going to introduce myself. Um, as you can see on the slide, my name is Jessica Schlar. I'm an executive director at MBA Mission. I have been at MBA Mission for 15 years. So I have spoken to thousands of applicants. I have reviewed thousands of essays. I have worked with hundreds of clients. And I have loved every single minute of my job because I get to help you tell your story. And there's just nothing better than helping you see yourself in a different light and sell yourself to people and then change your life. So um, it's a really great opportunity. Um, I have my MBA from Harvard. I applied to, I went to Harvard undergrad. I then worked in admissions um, and I applied to five business schools, Harvard, Stanford, Yale, uh, Yale Kellogg and UCLA. I got into all five, which I am not boasting about. I'm just telling you because it gives some credibility. I know how to work on application essays. Um, when I worked in admissions before I, I um, went to business school, I worked for a small school that none of you have ever heard of and it was tiny and no one wanted to come talk to us about it. So I had to develop ways to get the school's name out there without it being a tie to the school. So I started traveling around the country giving workshops on how do you write application essays and how do you clarify your values when you're picking a school. And that's just been an amazing foundation for me. Went off, worked in the corporate world. I um, was at JP Morgan Chase. I was at American Express. And then I found my way here to MBA Mission 15 years ago. So how today is gonna work. Um, I am going to go through a few slides about essay writing. I'm also looking at the comments. I want to get through the slides so that I can answer your questions because, oh my goodness, you're coming in from India where it's really, really late or early, depending how you think of it. Um, I would like to get to your questions. So if you have a question that is preventing you from understanding what I'm saying, I use an acronym that you don't know or you just didn't hear something right, please put that in the comments. But if it's a question that is just pertaining to you, hold that because I'll get distracted and start trying to answer that and I don't want to, I want to get through the material. So again, questions that are um, about the material, go ahead and post those up and I'll try to answer those so that people aren't confused. Otherwise, wait and we'll get through to the Q&A at the end. So we are going to talk today about creating standout business school essays. The most important thing to know is that you own your application. You are not somebody else's story. You are not a checklist of, you know, white male venture capitalist, male Indian engineer. That's not who you are. You are you. And that's what's important for you to get through to the admissions committee. If there were a standard formula, certain GMAT, certain GPA, certain number of years of work experience equals acceptance to X school, then there wouldn't be any essays. The essays are your chance to showcase who you are. I want to touch on these second and third and fourth bullet points. Why tell Kellogg a marketing story if you have no marketing experience? Or why tell Columbia a finance story if you have no finance experience? I have seen people say, oh, Kellogg's a marketing school, so I have to tell a marketing story so that they'll like me. But take a step back. A couple of things happen if you approach the application that way. One is you're competing against people who have strong marketing stories and you're telling a weak story. So now you're comparing a weak story to a strong story, why would they take you? More significantly, you have your own strong stories. Let's say you have a strong operations story or a strong integrity story. You're not leading with your strength. Tell that story. Kellogg does not only want marketers. Columbia does not only want finance people. They are trying to build a diverse class. So your experience uh, it should be about your own strengths because 
they don't want everybody to be for marketing and they're not going to take someone with weak marketing, but they might be desperate to take someone with a strong operation story. So figure out your strengths, your passion, and that's the story you tell. Avoid asking the question, what do they want to hear? Derek Bolton, the former director of admissions at Stanford, has this great quote. Because we want to discover who you are, resist the urge to package yourself in order to come across in a way you think Stanford wants. Such attempts simply blur our understanding of who you are and what you can accomplish. I cannot tell you the number of times people have been working with someone on Stanford's What Matters Most to You and Why essay, and they say to me, what does Stanford want to hear? Well, they want to hear what matters most to you. Okay, but does that mean I have to write about some charity? Uh, well, if that doesn't mean something to you, no. Well, but then what, do they, what matters most to me that nobody else is going to write about? I can't tell you what 5,000 other applicants are saying. I can only focus with you and help you explore what matters most to you. I have seen people write about religion, death, insecurities, um, any, you know, there's, there's no limit on that essay. It is really about you and looking inward. And that applies for all the essays. Don't guess what the school wants to hear. Tell them who you are. Okay. This next two slides, I could spend half an hour on and in our full essay writing presentation, which lasts for two hours, we do. So I'm just going to give you a taste of this. Stop and think. This is how I approach every application. Sit down and I write out, because I'm still old fashioned and I like to handwrite. I write in a dedicated notebook all the questions for that school. Then as I'm brainstorming with a client or as I'm preparing, I list under that those questions every story I can think of for that client. Then step back and say, okay, how do we match them? Because if you jump into assuming that a question from school A automatically translates into school B, you might miss telling them something more about you depending on what the questions ask. Okay? So what's really important is to stop and think. We spend a lot of time with our clients, and I urge you to do this too, with this multi-dimensional brainstorming. Here's a method for doing that. Step one on the top here, just list your roles. At work, you're a project manager. You volunteer at work as a health committee leader, this fictional person. Um, you're also on the side involved with, with a theater board and at volunteer work, and you have a really close relationship with your grandmother. That's step one. You're just listing the different roles in your life. We haven't talked about essays yet. Step two, take each of those roles and drill down. So here's the example just of the drill down for project manager. What did you do in that role? These are just random questions. How did you forge the team? Did any team member require special attention? What was your relationship with the client? How did you motivate and moralize employees? You're trying to get underneath the job to the actions and the impact. You would do the same for the health committee leader, same for the theater board, same for the grandson. So here are examples. And then you have to decide what you want to say and don't say. So you can see in this hypothetical example, this person listed all their roles, then they drill down to different stories. Now they can start thinking about the essays. So let's say they're looking at Kellogg. Hasn't come out with essays for this year yet, but last year they said, describe a, an example where you uh, added value at an organization. And the other question is, what values are important to you and how have you expressed them in your life? So maybe this person is going to say, I really want to focus for that time that you added value to an organization on this theater board. I navigated a board dynamic, I fundraised, and I was really hands-on. I can spend a whole essay talking about that. But when I think about values, being a grandson, being on the health committee, um, or you know, developing relationship with clients, those are all important values to me. And I'm gonna now pull those stories, okay? I know I flew through that. Um, I have a question here. Thank you for this. On patching your, packaging yourself and based on MBA career reports, investment banking is not a priority for some, especially HBS and GSB. Is it worth varying your career goals by school? I'm going to do I'm going to hold that question because I actually have a couple of slides on the career goal. So I'm going to come back to that. But my short answer is minor tweaks only because the career goal really has to tie very heavily to who you are and what you've done. Otherwise, it doesn't have credibility and you haven't done so much 
that you can completely vary up your career goal for each one. It's also a lot more work to do it that way. But we'll come back to that question after I get to my slides on career goals. Okay. All right, this is really important. An essay is not really the right word. Essays sound very formal, right? I don't know if you were all taught the way I was, five paragraph essay, tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them the three facts that you are gonna tell them and then tell them what you told them. That's school. This is a narrative. This is a story. It's almost like a memoir. It's much more personal. It's first person. You have a lot of humility, simplicity. You do not have to write in a really fancy, intricate way. In fact, I strongly encourage you to read your essays out loud. In fact, one of my favorite tips is to read a sentence out loud, but put your best friend's name in front of it as you're, if you're talking to them. So you say, hey, John, I manifested the project by envisioning a, a vision board that would, would you talk that way? If when you talk with your best friend, you wouldn't use those words, it's probably not right for an essay. I love that tip because it really comes to life. You do not need to use long, multisyllabic words. You need to write like you. If you read your essay out loud and you stumble over the words, probably isn't the right words, right? And show, don't tell. Put the reader in the moment. There's a huge difference between saying, I love dogs and I always try to rescue dogs. That's telling. Showing would be every night you'll find me walking up and down Broadway, uh, hammering signs on posts for dogs I'm trying to reunite with their owners. You're putting the reader in the story. You're letting the reader figure out the conclusion instead of just telling them up front. Okay. All right. Opening lines. I live by opening lines. I love opening lines. The opening lines are sort of the way I think. When I'm working with a client, I will talk about opening lines almost every single conversation. I'm like, let's grab their attention. Let's think this way. The, here, here are four methods. At the end of reading these, I'm actually going to ask you this question at the bottom. Are they equally effective? So here's the straightforward essay. After five months of hard work, my startup gelato concept shut down and I lost my life savings. Here's where you just launch into the story. When I left McKinsey to start Freshtastic Gelato, my mentor questioned my sanity and my mother literally cried. Before I had even handed in my security tag, I was elbow deep, presumably in gelato. Anecdotal, elbow deep in gelato, I washed my hands and lunged for the phone. Or the inverted, I actually think of this one as the visual. One quart tubs lined the refrigerated shelves. As the suns blazed, customers lined up for two city blocks. Still, the bankers were lining up as well. I love the visual of that. So I'm going to take a pause here so I can grab a drink of water and ask you while I'm taking a sip, which of these do you like? Um, you can label them A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four, straightforward, launch, anecdotal, inverted. I will figure it out. So which of these, actually, I'm going to switch the question. Are there any of these that you do not like? Tell me if there's one you don't like. No one's going to tell you that you did the wrong answer. Or even if I say I don't agree with you, you're not going to get docked from business school. Um, you don't like the first and second. Sparna, thank you. Anyone else? C. I prefer straightforward over anecdotal. Inverted is also compelling. Okay. Thank you, guys, too. All right. So from our perspective, launch, anecdotal, and inverted are all terrific. Straightforward gives away the entire story. I have no incentive to read the rest of the essay. I know he worked hard, had a startup concept, and it didn't work, and he, he failed. That, can, if that, that opening line does not make me want to continue reading the essay because I know it all. Whereas all of the other three are intriguing to me. I want to know more about what happened. Uh, my personal favorite is the inverted one. I love that visual of tubs, customers, and... Um, you can't see my hands, and bankers all lined up in different lines, all converging on this one little gelato shop. Um, I love that visual, but you know, there's nothing, if you prefer launch, if you prefer anecdotal, those are fine for essays. I would just really try to avoid straightforward, okay? 
often you'll start the essay with the straightforward one. And then one of my clients sends me, I just delete it because it's a good way to get started. It gives you some comfort that you're getting, that you're beginning. But honestly, you want your reader to keep reading. And if they know the ending already, um, you know, do you flip to the back page of the book, see who killed them? Like, you, know, then you want, don't want to give away the story from the whole beginning. Okay. All right. Keep it simple. This is primarily for resumes, but also very heavily for essays. I pulled every one of these phrases on here from um, client essays or resumes. First drafts, no one ever submitted anything like this. So I rationalized the internal application portfolio for. I led the basic design concepts with digital hardware design, such as DC loading analysis, AC timing analysis, as EMI slash EMC design for test concept. No business school admissions reader wants to hear those. What they want to know is that you led design concepts and what happened. You know, led a team in developing two design concepts for hardware design, persuaded the organization on which one to go with, and that product is currently our the best seller, right? I mean, I butchered that, but they want to know from a business perspective, how did you lead and what was the impact? For a engineering or a technical job resume, sure, put those in. Business schools do not care if you used AC timing analysis or EMI-EMC. They want to know what did you lead, who did you lead, what was the impact of the project, okay? Avoid overwrought or flowery language. This I literally pulled from a client's essay 12 years ago, but it still works. As I gazed at the New York skyline, which represents the hopes and dreams of so many of us who have come before, I was filled with inspiration that I too, like them, would one day reach the pinnacle of the financial industry. It's really hard to read that in a straightforward voice. And let's try the best friend tip, okay? Hey, John, as I gazed at the New York skyline, which represents the hopes and dreams of so many who had come before, would you ever talk like that? I, I don't know that you would. So just be straightforward. Talk to the admissions committee in a, you know, not like you talk to your best friend. You want to be a little more polished, but in a very direct and straightforward way. All right, get ready, because I am asking for more interaction here. I was engaged in the pursuit of passing my CFA exam. Can somebody please rewrite that for me much shorter and more straightforward? That's 11 words. Can you do it in seven or five, six, seven or six? I was focused on my CFA exam. Thank you, Roshan, exactly. I was studying for the CFA. I studied for the CFA, even shorter, right? Engaged in the pursuit of, you would not talk like that. Right, I was so part of that, I was studying for the CFA, exactly. Here, my goal entails providing counsel to key players in the technology space. I want to advise technology companies, right? Much more straightforward. And then here, excessive synonym uses, I coached, guided, and mentored. You just don't have room. These essays all have really tight word space. Yes, coach, guided, and mentored are slightly different, but you can pick one, okay? We just don't have room. On your resume, there's more important things to say on your resume or the essays. Okay, H, we're getting to the goals now. Short-term goals. When I graduate, I want to join and modernize a vineyard. Thereafter, I will climb the ladder and become a partner in this vineyard. We very helpfully put the word bad here. Why is this bad? Because it has no context. We have no idea if this person is capable of this role or what is their involvement with, or it just comes out of the blue, right? Slightly better, when I graduate, I will continue on my path in the wine industry. Okay, that continue is helpful. That tells us that there's some connection to it. Only now on the manufacturing side. Okay, still helpful. They were in it, but they, we don't know it what, but they were now switching sides. I hope to join a small vineyard and apply the skills I learned in my MBA to the betterment of the organization. In the future, I'll seek to start or purchase a vineyard and employ the techniques I've learned in my career during my entrepreneurial days. Okay, 
So it's better, it's more specific, but let's get to the really good one. With my background as a wine journalist, I am well aware of the traditional aspects of the winemaking industry and recognize that many vintners are slow to adapt to modern manufacturing and marketing techniques. With my MBA, I will have the specific entrepreneurial and operational skills necessary to develop a small vineyard and nurture it so that it realizes its full potential. In my first position, I see myself as general manager of an antiquated vineyard in the ABC region, implementing operational efficiencies, access and capital for growth, and marketing a superior product nationally or even internationally. Okay. This connects. They're a wine journalist. They've proven their credibility of the industry. They said, I understand the traditional aspects and have seen that they're slow to adapt. So I want to bring my own knowledge of the industry along with my MBA skills and develop a vineyard and then grow it and use modern techniques to prove this. This is a very credible goal. Now, going back to your question, H, do you see how it would be really hard to come up with a different goal that had this same foundation? Yes, this person could say with my background as a wine journalist, I now want to start an online wine magazine. But there's not, you know, a, there's there has to be a lot of continuity. Fundamentally, there are four sections for every career essay. Short-term goals, long-term goals, how your background has prepared you, and how the school will help you get there. So, it's a gap essay. You're defining a gap. This person has defined a gap from they know the industry and they know that it needs more modernization uh, and they know what they want to do to own a vineyard and, and implement this, but they have a gap from the operational and entrepreneurial skills and that's what they need business school to teach them. Okay. Exactly, tweaks around the edges only. All right, so let's talk about why school X. So again, bad, better, good. Kellogg is remarkable because of its wealth of biotech. This is obviously a different hypothetical client, by the way, uh, applicant. Kellogg is remarkable because of its wealth of biotech and healthcare resources. I'm excited to join a community of aggressive innovators. I really believe, really, that the health enterprise management major is unique. It's probably not unique. And offers a depth of courses and practical offerings unmatched by other schools. Don't slam other schools. Somebody answer this. It's a, not a trick question. It's really easy. If this person in the bullet point one was applying to, I don't know, Columbia, what would they have to change in this mini paragraph here? Okay, no one's answering. Nothing. Then they change the name of the school, right? Yeah, school name may be the health enterprise management major name. That's it. This does not tell Kellogg that they really understand anything about the school. Okay, avoid the word unique. There's not a lot of courses or programs that are unique. Um, avoid, I really believe. It's just, just taking up space. And avoid unmatched by other schools. It's the best place for me. It's just words. It's not convincing. It's telling, not showing. Okay. Here's a better one. Kellogg is remarkable. Well, I would avoid phrases like that. They already know they're remarkable. They work there. So Kellogg is remarkable because of its wealth of biotech and um, healthcare resources. They know that. Okay. I look forward to joining a community of aggressive and exciting innovators. I really believe that the health enterprise management major is unique and offers a depth of courses and practical offerings unmatched by other schools. Again, they probably know all this. The Global Health Initiative would be a wonderful and memorable experience. They probably think that too. I'm attracted to the medical innovation class and intellectual capital management too. Clearly Kellogg offers a profound education for me. This is better because at least it shows that the person's done research into Kellogg. It's not entirely a copy and paste, but there's not that much that has to change. And again, this person is falling into the trap of telling the school what they already know, right? I want to go to Stanford because it's located in the heart of Silicon Valley. The business schools know that. They go to work there. Stanford people go to work there every day. Here is a sentence you can write down. Okay. Don't tell the school what they already know. Instead, tell them how those facts that they know are relevant to you. Okay. 
Here's an example. What appeals to me about the health enterprise management major is I can delve into the traditional management offerings at a high level while engaging in the pure science at the beginner level, where I admittedly currently stand. The science bootcamp and tutorials will ensure that I am conversant in the language of the field and will prepare me for the advanced courses that will be crucial for my success. Considering my career interests, I'm looking forward to intellectual capital management and medical innovation, where I would experience an unprecedented view into the innovation life cycle. I'd also seize the opportunity to join the Global Health Initiative. Do you see how different this is? This is not saying, um, I believe that the health management major, enterprise management major is unique and offers depth, depth of courses. It's saying, I would delve into the traditional management, but also delve into the pure science. This is how I will interact with, relate to these facts that you already know. Okay. This is really important. This is probably the hardest part of any essay, a school essay, is why do you want to go here? Because it's really hard to sound unique. The best way to, to do it is to have conversations. If you cannot visit the school, have conversations with people. You want to write about something that no one else can write about because it only happened to you. Okay? And that might be a conversation you had with someone where you would quote them and talk about what, what you learned from them. Basically, how is a particular aspect of that school would help you connect? Uh, how could, yes, exactly, Roshan. It's basically, well, there are three questions that I usually tell my clients to research. One is, how will the school's academic and professional offerings enable you to achieve your career goal? Okay. Two, how will you both benefit from and contribute to the school's non-academic offerings? You've always led hikes, you know, for your volunteer work. So you're really excited to join Dar Talk Dartmouth Hiking Club, where you can lead hikes, right? You teach them about you. And the third is how is the school a personal fit? Okay. If you love being out uh, out in the city and exploring different venues and meeting with professionals where they work, Tuck is not going to be a good school for you because it's isolated. On the other hand, if you want to build these incredibly close-knit ties with your classmates and be outdoors and do all these trust and outdoor adventures together, Tuck is made for you. You need to understand the school's culture in order to know if you are a good fit. It's hard to imagine someone being an equally good fit for Columbia and for Tuck. They are so different. Okay. All right. I'm going to do one minute on us and then um, open it up to your questions. We are the number one firm by Poets and Quants and the highest firm on GMAT Club. We are the only one that has ever won that at all, let alone three years in a row. We are um, the only firm recommended by Manhattan Prep. Our secret sauce, what really makes us stand out, is that we have full-time consultants who all have MBAs and are all writers. That writer piece is so important because someone who's an admissions officer can look at the finished product and know if they like it or not, kind of like a food critic can look at a, a tasted meal and see if they like it. But it's only the chef, it's only the writer who can tweak the ingredients to get you to that final product. That's what our secret is, is how we have MBA, so we know what you're going through. We know what the schools are all about. We are full time because you deserve that. You don't want us to cancel a meeting because our boss and our real job schedule something. You don't want us to miss a deadline with your essays because something else came up. We only are dedicated to you and our families. But we actually don't see our families that much um, during the busy season. We collaborate. Um, there are firms out there, and you can ask them this, that do not train their staff. They do not let their consultants talk to each other. We actually have an active Slack database. We email each other all day long. I read two or three essays for someone today. Someone else read one for me. We share ideas. You have a dedicated consultant because that's how we get to know you in depth, but we share across the team when we have questions. Um, and we're already working for you with lots of events. If you go to our website, mbamission.com, we have a ton of free publications. In fact, every single publication is free except for the guide to Harvard and Stanford essays. It's called What Matters and What Matters More. And it's pretty discounted. I think it was originally $60. I think we have it on sale for 18. But otherwise, Insider's Guides, we have a three or four person research team that does nothing but write Insider's Guides to schools every year. We have admissions guides, ton of presentations, ton of blog posts, interviews. That's us. I'm landing on this page for the q and I'm sorry this is in green, but that's our website. That's our email address. That's our link for free consultations. 
and that's our link to all of our free publications. H, for you in particular, we, but everybody, we have a 30-page essay that just talks about the career essay. It's called um, the MBA Mission Free Personal Statement Guide. It talks about everything I discussed in those two slides. It covers all of it. Okay. All right. I am done with the presentation piece, and now I'm going to go back to the questions. I just want to um, scroll up because there have been some that have been coming in. Um, okay. H, you said I answered your question about packaging yourself. So thank you. Um, okay. So the next question is uh, JF Mann. For HBS and GSB, there's so much you could share for your their hallmark prompts. What are the must answer questions to address or areas to cover? That's like an hour answer, but let me do it for you in two or three minutes. So let's take HBS first. HBS is 900 words for the essay. And the question is, we've seen your resume, we've seen your recommendations, we've seen the application, what more do you want us to know? What that is really saying is, don't recap your resume. You can refer to different things, but we don't want your resume but now in paragraph form. We really wanna understand, what do we not know about you from all of this? So I think of the resume and the application as answering the what question. What has JF Mann done? But the, um, the essay, what more, is who are you? Who is JF Mann? Why is that what you've done? Why are those the choices you've made? What's informed their path through life? It is not, adamantly not, a YHBS essay, okay? I promise you they do not want to read 10,000 essays about how much they, you love the case method. Uh, if you get an interview, you have an essay due 24 hours after the interview, which in which you can talk about YHBS. And the interview itself is very focused on goals. There is a mini 500 character goal essay, 500 characters, not 500 words, 500 characters. Spaces count. It's about, I don't know, 100 words. It's pretty small. Um, that is... Uh, there is a career essay. You may include the career essay if it flows logically from who you are and what you've done in life and, and what's driving you. Okay. There's no right answer, but that's those are the wrong answers. Don't write about it why HBS and don't do a career recap. Okay. For Stanford, there are actually six essays for Stanford. There are two required and four optional, although, as my kids will testify, I told them about homework, optional is not optional. So you have um, what matters most to you and why. 650 words, although Stanford gives you the leeway to choose between the two required essays, how many words, and why Stanford. Why Stanford is your career essay. Just as we talked about, the logical flow from where you, where you are to where you're going and how Stanford will help you fit. If you only write 400 words on what you love about Stanford, there's no context to it. You have to explain why Stanford for you, not just in theory. What matters most to you and why is they call it bleeding on paper. It really is what matters most to you. What gets you out of, of bed in the morning? What drives you? It is not a career essay. It may be the emotional underpinning for your career, but it does not have to be. I have seen them be connected. I've seen them be totally different. Okay. Then the four optional essays are about 1,200 characters each. One is how your family background or your your know, background experiences have shaped recent decisions, recent being in the last three years. So this is a two time period. You know, I moved around a lot in school that may, it, growing up that made me really adaptable, um, but it also meant that I crave home and that's why I spend so much time today building community. That could be an, an example. And then the other three are um, 1200 characters each of times that you made an impact and why that impact was significant. So. The reason I think this, that Stanford asks for those three impact essays is to force you to go deep on what matters most to you and why. What I want you to avoid and what matters most and why is, oh, I, should, I want to give them these three examples of mentoring and then tell them that mentoring matters most. Here's an example of how I mentored in college. Here's an example of how I mentor at work. Here's an example of how I mentor today. That's too surface. They don't want all these anecdotes. They want to know who you are. If you want to write about mentoring, that's fine, but go deeper than just here are some examples. Okay, that was all I could do in this time. You're welcome to come to a consultation and I could talk to you um, about it more. Okay, um, Separna, if I'm writing application essays for 10 schools, how can I ensure that all of them are unique and I'm not writing the same content for two different schools? Well, to some degree, you don't have to, 
and to some degree you do. The core of your career essay is going to be the same, right? You're going to talk about your past and your future for all schools. You're not tweaking the career essay. So the part of that essay that's different is the um, why this school. You also might, I always think of it as an accordion. You have 650 words of what matters most to you and why for Stanford, but um, Berkeley says, what makes you feel alive when doing it? Maybe those are the same. So I think that it starts with looking at the question and then look at the essay bank of what you've written so far. Are there themes, are there paragraphs that apply over? What I want you to avoid is just copying and pasting an essay and not really looking at what the question is asking because the schools spend a lot of time picking their questions and they will know if you're just using someone else's material. So I would avoid having core phrases like when you write, for Berkeley, what makes me feel alive when doing it, don't say, and this is what matters most to me, because that's a Stanford phrase. But as long as you are answering the question, it's fine to reuse ideas and concepts. You are you, and you only have so many great stories and just make them fit, okay? All right. Um, oh, good, thank you for putting up the consult. I know there are no other questions, that's not fair. Give me more questions. There have to be more questions. I know you've been going to these sessions. I did one of these four hours ago and I had to leave with 45 questions left in the queue because I had to get out of the room because someone else was gonna use it um, for one of these sessions. So I thought some of you were coming with these essays. Um, Suparna, was that helpful? Good, okay, thank you, it was. What else? Anyone have specific questions about your story? How much time do you think we need to spend on essays? So. Please, it really depends on how comfortable a writer you are um, and whether you think about the essays, including the research on the schools, right? And also how many. You might spend much less time on a school that has, you know, UT Austin McCombs came out today with its question. It's only one and it's a cover letter, which is, but it's not like the MIT cover letter. It's really a career essay in the guise of a cover letter. So you might not spend a lot of time on McCombs if that's your third school because you've done a cover letter for other schools. So the only piece that you're working on is why McCombs will help you get there. Um, but generally we use as a rule of thumb, and it's a horrible rule of thumb because everybody is different. Uh, and some people write easily, some people don't. It just changes a lot. But the rough rule of thumb is a first application, application overall takes 30 to 40 hours. That includes the resume, the short answers on the application itself, and the essays. A second school is probably gonna take you closer to 20 to 30. And then after, the, after that, third, fourth, fifth schools, maybe around 10, 10, 15. But if Stanford is your fourth school and there are six essays, that's gonna take you a lot longer than Yale, which is one essay. So it just depends on how much you can reuse um, of the paragraphs, how much shrinking and growing you have to do for your essays. Um, um, how long do we have to prepare? Okay, that was the same question. How long do we have to prepare for writing essays for one school? You know, that's the biggest piece. What I'll just give you a sort of a rule of thumb. When I'm working with a client, we send them a brainstorming document. They spend five to seven hours working on it. It should be 20 to 30 pages when it's done. They send that to me. I spend about two or three hours reading it several times, probing for questions, looking to see what I want to explore, and coming up with a set of ideas for the various questions. Then we get on the phone for about an hour and a half and really drill into those areas I wanted to probe and to aligning ideas and flow for that one school. So between their time and my time, that's about nine, 10 hours of prep. But we don't need to do that for the second school, right? I, today I brainstormed with someone for his second and third school. I'd spent all that time for this first school for this one, I spent about half an hour of prep and we were on the phone for an hour and 15 minutes and we brainstormed. Uh, so that was less than two hours and we brainstormed two schools in that time. So it gets faster and faster. There's a lot of work in the first school, then it gets easier. Um, okay, any advice for older applicants? Yes, so older applicants, um, there's a rumor, there's a belief that older, app older applicants are not wanted. It's really not true. They just have to make sure that you fit. So if you're an older applicant because you've been stagnating in your career and you have no idea what you want to do and you're not all that good at it, that's not a good applicant. But I worked with someone who was in his 30s who was about to apply when he was 28 and his family went bankrupt. 
And it took him three years to turn around the family business and get his family enough financial support uh, and stability to be able to apply. So in that case, being older didn't hurt him at all because there was a really legitimate and compelling story for that. Um, one thing that the schools will want to know is that you are comfortable as an older applicant interacting with, being led by, being on teams with much younger applicants. So you somehow want to show that in your question, in your essays, that you um, get along well and are open to ideas from all types. Okay, any advice for the video essay prompt? So Roshan, it depends if you know the prompts in advance or not. Some schools you do and some you don't. If you know it in advance, like the, like Kellogg typically says, you know, it, 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 it tell us what your short and long-term career goals. You should be prepared for that. Practice it a couple times, but you should know how to do that. But if you get a question you're not prepared for, I would say like, you know, who's the, what's your story and why, or what's your favorite movie or something like that, which you, you can't necessarily prepare for. Remember that the point of the video essays is not the content of the answer. Obviously you're not gonna be offensive, but you know, within that range of sort of normal human behavior, the point of the video essay is to make sure you can speak English, to get a sense of your personality, and just to see who you are. So if you make a mistake, if you stumble over a word and you laugh at yourself and you keep going, that's great. I don't want you to stumble on purpose. But when I've seen that happen, it just makes you come alive. They are not looking for robotic people who have practiced every single answer. They're just looking to see, are you comfortable talking to someone, in this case, to a screen? All right. Several schools have questions about values, how you, to, you approach those authentically. Sometimes they feel very kitschy. Yes, they can. And um, unfortunately, my advice is kind of kitschy too, which is you have to approach them authentically, which is what you just said, right? You really have to think about what is it that drives you, right? When you think about the Kellogg essay or what makes you feel alive when doing it or the Stanford essay, it's not, I, I would say you want to keep asking why. So mentoring matters most to me. Well, why? Well, because I wasn't mentored much growing up. I'll give you an actually better example. I, I worked with someone who was my first or second year here. And he said, well, it's obvious what matters most to me, money. I said, why? He said, because it's money. I said, okay, why? He looks at me like I'm an idiot. He's like, because it's money. I'm like, okay, what can you do with money? He's like, well, I can buy things with it. I said, okay, what can you buy with it? And he's really like almost yelling at me. And finally he's like, I can buy my parents a house with it. I'm like, oh, why would you buy your parents a house? Because they sacrificed everything for me and they've always been renters and that's what, oh, so supporting your family. So that's what matters most. We had to drill. I mean, he really got angry at me because he really thought I was stupid because money obviously is what matters, but it wasn't money. It was what money can do for him, which was really about giving back to his family. So you just have to think it through. Ask your friends and family, what have you done? Look at what you carve out time for. Do you always go to the gym? Well, then probably health is a value for you. Do you never miss a Sunday dinner at home? Well, then family might be a value for you. Behavior should indicate your values, okay? All right, uh, Fariz, let's say you wanna go from tech consulting to um, values, I'm sorry, to strategic consulting. How do you convince the ad come that you can make the switch? Well, I like that switch because it's only changing one big thing. You're still in consulting. And so you really wanna think about what are the core transferable skills? You still know how to work in teams, you still know how to work with clients, you still know how to look at a big picture and break it down, but you wanna switch your focus from tech to strategy. So I would look at what is the most strategic project you've done within tech? When did you say, oh, I think I could be good at this, or I wanna do more of this? Um, I had a client who wanted to switch from a finance role to consulting, but she was in a financial consulting role, and she wrote, she, her opening of her essay was something that really happened where she was sitting in a room and they were all talking about a solution and she gave an idea and the client turned to her and said, you're our transfer pricing expert, not our strategy consultant. I don't want to hear that from you. The McKinsey consultant sitting next to her said, well, I think, and gave exactly the same reason and they implemented it and ran with it. That was a pretty great opening anecdote that proved she had the right instincts and also showed why she wanted to do it. So that's what I would look for. What was the moment when you said, oh, I can do strategy consulting. I've gotten a glimmer of it. Now I want to do more of that. All right, um, truly, pointers for re-applicants. What should I do differently? Um, that's really hard to answer without knowing what you did first. So I would say, think about what you did, what I talked about in this essay. Did you connect with your target? Really explain to them why that school mattered to you. 
Um, did you have a goal, career goal that made a lot of sense from where you were to where you're going? Um, did you have on your resume bullet points that focused on your impact, not just on the activities that you do every day? Uh, that's what I would, those are the sort of the, usually the biggest things we see people do wrong. Other than that, you know, I can say come to a free consultation. We also do ding reviews where we would look at the application and give you guidance. Or if you work with us, looking at your old application has to be part of the process because otherwise we don't know how to help you change. I will say that there are some essays that are very hard to change. What matters most to you and why really can't be something completely different or it sounds like you're just shooting, you know, see what happens this time, but you can express it in a different way. Your career goals can't be radically different. I used to want to, last year I said I wanted to go market Clorox bleach, but now I want to be an investment banker. Those are two radically different. But if you can find a way to evolve your career goals, narrow them down, be more specific, um, that usually works. Okay, uh, Roshan, how do I prime my resume for interaction? As I understand it, most school interviewers get your resume and not the essays. So that second part is absolutely correct. Um, the schools where interviewers will see your entire application are Harvard, MIT, NYU, and London Business School, maybe a couple of others. Um, all the other schools, your interviewer only ever sees your resume. And at Darden, University of Virginia, your interviewer doesn't even see that. So you want your resume to stand on its own. Um, at the same time, you have to make it one page and readable. Make sure the margins are about 0.5. Don't include everything. One of the things that business schools are trying to understand is, can you prioritize the most important information? If every single inch of your resume is squeezed in with six point font, you're telling them, I don't know how to prioritize. I don't know how to focus on the really key points. Um, we have a free resume guide that I would really encourage you to download. Make sure there's white space. Make sure that you focus on the impact. An ideal bullet point for a resume starts with a leadership word, led, managed, developed, built, then the target of the action, and then the impact, which resulted in. It should not be a responsibility. It should be something that is unique to you, not something anyone else in your position can say. It's something that you specifically did. Include college activities, college internships, but if you're more than five years out, those are the first things to go if you need to get it to one page. Nothing smaller than 10 point font. Um, the Economist, can I get into this university with a little number of social activities? I'm going to assume, and you can correct me, that what you mean is activities outside of work, that you um, don't have volunteer work, things like that. Yes, but they want to see leadership. They want to see activities. They want to see that you're engaged in the world around you. They are trying, this is one of the other core sentences you can write down, business schools are trying to build a community, not just fill their classes. So they want to see how are you going to interact with the community. If you don't have a lot of formal organizational volunteer work, look first, what do you do for your company? Is there anything you do at your company that is not part of your job? Either recruiting or volunteer project or new employee orientation or whatever, something that you were not hired to do, but you like to do. That is volunteer work, even if it's at your job. Secondly, look at anything that you certainly make time for that is organizational. You play on a squash league. Um, you, you know, get together a group of friends every week for dinner at a new restaurant. Those are things that you're committed to. Those are volunteer work or activities at least. And then the third thing is much more amorphous, not really good for the application of the resume, but could be very powerful for essays, is asking yourself and the people in your sphere, how have you made a difference in their life? I've had clients who took in their siblings when they didn't get along with their parents who looked out for their siblings. I've had people who, certainly during COVID, went out of their way to buy groceries for the neighbors. What do you do simply because of who you are? Those can be really powerful essays as well that can sometimes hide the lack of organized accomplishments. And I worked with one guy who did not have time for any formal accomplishments because he was raising three siblings. You know, that's, that's a volunteer work. Um, Leticia, you didn't finish the question, what if my story is a bit? Um, I'm hearing from many people for Faiz that tech consulting strategy can be done without an MBA. If that's true, won't Adcom think the same? Well, what's the Adcom's vested interest, right? They believe that an MBA is good. Otherwise, they wouldn't work there. So they're already inclined to believe that even if you could get that job without it, that um, you'll do better at it with it. 
And so now have we, knowing that they at least have that belief, it's your job to prove it. And so why will you be better at strategy consulting with an MBA? What will it teach you? That's you know, really research. Talk to people at the schools. Call the consulting club. Ask if there's anyone who's made that leap. Who can, can you talk to them? And then talk about what strategy skills they learned and how will you be able to manage teams better, um, speak with clients better, have more of an executive presence. They are going to believe that it's necessary as long as you prove it to them as well. But they're already inclined to do that because that justifies their jobs. Okay. I think I have time for one more. Leticia, I'm sorry you didn't get to finish your question. If you want to email me at that info at um, mbamission.com, I'll answer it there. But um, Suparta, should we talk about previous roles and what we learned from the essays? And should all the job roles be lastly connected to the question, how will an MBA help? You do not have to tie every single job to it. You're not, like, they understand that people have evolved and grown. But the job should have some kind of flow in that, you learn something from each job that you're taking with you. Maybe what you learned is that you don't like that kind of small group um, sort of short-term consulting that you want to be around to implement. So you tried it, it didn't work for you, you did something else. Um, you don't have to touch on every job, is, but you kind of want there to be that progression. If you've had more than two or three jobs, you really cannot you know, focus too much on the early ones. Generally, in those cases, I'll talk about how the early job gave you a really solid foundation which then let you, um, and you know, and now you want to specialize. Or that, you know, finance, you gained a lot of finance skills from fears in investment banking, but soon realized that that's not the atmosphere you wanted to work in, and so you took a job um, in a company. That's fine. Those kinds of finance and consulting jobs are really solid core foundational work for anything you want to do afterwards. Um, Non-traditional, so Mario Stem, I guess I have one more. Any suggestions for a non-traditional applicant, what to highlight in the application, specifically an elected politician from Latin America with 10 years of government work? Um, okay, so first of all, there are two programs that are full-time MBAs for people with eight and 10 years work experience, Stanford MSX and MIT Sloan Fellows. They're full-time, they're one year, and your age goes away as a factor. Secondly, business schools want diversity you bring a perspective that is so different from other people. So there's still that burden of you've been an elected official. How can you, you know, will you be able to get along really well with um, people who are much younger than you? But campaign work is so powerful, right? What you've had to do in terms of facing rejection, um, marketing yourself, talking to people, these are all core skills. So how you market yourself somehow de what depends on where you want to go. Like the last politician I worked with had talked a lot about going door to door and making his, his mission because he was from a um, very uh, suburb that did not welcome diversity and he was diverse. So he made a lot of point about talking to people and learning what they were thinking and learning to rebut those difficult arguments. But his goal was actually to go into a family manufacturing business. So that was a very different leap uh, from someone who wants to remain in a government role. So I think that it sounds to me like you have a great story to tell, but how you tell it depends a lot on where you're going. Okay. Um, I'm 36, work as a director in a big retail company. Am I too old for GSB and HBS? You know, you're definitely on the older side. I have seen 32 to 38 year olds get into top schools, not off the top of my head, HBS and GSB, but the numbers are so small of who applies. The same thing really stands in. Are you able to make a compelling reason why that is the right degree for you? I will say that the one-year program at GSB, the MSX, um, which is for older applicants, you can apply to that on the same application as the two-year MBA. You just check a box that says, consider me for both programs, and they can decide. So that's a really nice option for you. Okay. All right. It looks like I'm being told to leave, so I am done. Um, just email the info at MBA Mission and put my name in the subject line. Agarwal, KP, um, happy to have a free consultation with you. Anyone who wants info at mbamission.com, um, you can just put, I'd like a consultation with Jessica. The faster way is just sign up for a free consultation and put my name where it asks, have you connected with a consultant? Put my name, the office will send it to me, and I'll email you to schedule something. Okay? So we are very available uh, at all times. 
And if you email me directly, and my, my public schedule for consultations fills up two or three weeks in advance. So if you email me, I'll try to fit you in earlier. Okay. All righty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was great. Um, I appreciate you being here. Thank you to GMAT Club. This has been an amazing couple of days of events. I'm sure you're exhausted, um, but this is really terrific. So I'm going to, oh, one last question. I've been asking my son to apply for business schools and more category M7, postgrad degrees. Okay, just um, just have him contact me, okay? We'll figure it out. Um, oh, the economist, doesn't less than two years of work it reduce the chance of getting in? Yeah, less than two years is pretty hard. I have seen someone with one year get in, but she had a family business that she'd been working in since she was five years old. Um, less than two years really is difficult to get in, at least for a top 10 to 15 school. Um, Harvard and Stanford really are looking for four, five, six years. The other schools, two to four. It depends what you've done. If you've done something truly phenomenal that has changed your company and it's been very significant, you've got a chance. But in general, we like to see minimum of two but before you even apply, which gives you three before you start, better three to four. Okay. All right. I'm not going to look anymore because I keep seeing questions come in. You know how to reach me. Um, thank you so much, GMAT Club. I am leaving the studio. Okay. Jessica out. Bye.